Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm trying to join. Um, I don't see the video. Uh oh, she can't see. You don't see video? I oh wait I I have a few reviewer assignment I want him to do for me <laughs> this is an Oxford Bell I hear Oxford, no, there's no Oxford things going on here. And Cambridge, of course. Uh, no, no bells. We will, um, let's wait one minute for people to make sure they're in. And next <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed, but there was an inquiry on the page about whether this was going to be recorded. Um, so it is, is unless, uh, unless you don't want it to be. Okay. So currently it's being recorded. Okay. Does somebody want to answer that or hmm? somebody should answer that? You want me to say yes? I can easily type it in. Did, did you not hear me? Yeah, it is being recorded. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm going to mute everyone. So unmute yourself if you want to talk. Now I'm the only one talking. <laughs> okay, Denny, I will um, take it from here. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Howard Grenville. I'm the one of the deputy editors at AMJ, and um, we're delighted to have you here this afternoon, evening, morning, or middle of the night, depending on where you are. Um, we, uh, the group that's that's sort of facilitating this session today, is um, appropriately a group of Canadians, or in some cases, former Canadians. So I'm joined by Denis Grégoire, who is. Um, currently at HSC Montreal. He's one of our macro associate editors and Ivana um, Heidig, who is a micro associate editor from York. And we also have um, a total of 10 or maybe 11 of us um, from the editorial team in the room today and we'll do breakouts later on. So thanks for joining us. We're going to give a quick sort of, I will give a quick overview of um, AMJ and um, as soon as I can get my slides to advance, there we go. Um, and just sort of tell you who we are, what we're doing. I think you will have varying levels of experience with AMJ. So um, we'll just highlight some of the key facts about the journal and um, our editorial team is one year into its three year role. So we want to also just introduce the team and make sure you know about anything new like our special issue, for example. Um, and then Ivana will talk about some um, ways to be successful in your submission to AMJ um, from the micro AE's perspective and Denny will follow up with a uh, macro AE perspective on that. Um, and then we're going to move pretty quickly. You'll see um, the website said this was a three hour session and I don't know how many of you can handle three hour sessions on Zoom, but we felt we couldn't. So we're going to make things a little crisper and we'll go straight into breakouts as soon as we can after about 30, 45 minutes. Um, you'll have lots of time um, with an associate editor in a breakout room. I realize the time is actually wrong. That is 40 minutes, but um, we'll get there. Um, and Denny will give you information on how to select a breakout room. So they will not be randomly assigned. Um, so, you know, there'll be some topics that are maybe of special interest for different types of research, but we can also absolutely answer um, general questions about AMJ and publishing in AMJ. Um, and then we will come back to this collective Zoom and have open Q&A right at the end after you've had the individual discussions in your breakout rooms. So without further ado, um, what is AMJ's mission? How are we different from other journals? Um, 
so the key thing to notice with AMJ is that it's a journal that publishes empirical research, but we have a very strong emphasis on theory. So we look for papers that make a significant contribution, both empirically and theoretically. Um, and so that's sort of a, a bare minimum. So if you have a theory only paper, we're not your journal. Um, we want to look first and foremost for a strong and novel um, theoretical contribution. And so we're looking for things that are original, insightful, interesting, and important. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later in terms of what we count as important in our world today. Um, so the other thing to emphasize is if you're a member of Academy of Management, um, there is a conversation in Academy of Management journal that is for you. So we cut across all of the divisions, all of the topic areas, and all of the types of, of research um, uh, empirical research that is done out there um, and we have a fantastic team not only of 23 editors and associate editors but also over 300 editorial review board members who are willing to not just willing to able to give high quality reviews and feedback on any paper coming from any corner of the academy so we welcome submissions from absolutely everyone in that sense um, here are some quick numbers for you so we do get a large number of manuscripts each year um, about 50 percent of those or maybe a little bit more go out for full review there's Obviously, that other number, 45% or more, are desk rejected. Now, what that means is often people haven't actually read the website. So they're not necessarily sending a paper that would suit AMJ. It doesn't have empirical data. It's actually for a finance journal, et cetera, et cetera. Or in some cases, it's just not well enough developed. It doesn't contain enough data or enough emphasis on theory and novel insight um, for us to be able to send it out and get a set of reviews that would allow it to advance. So we do have a highly selective, very, very skilled um, editorial review board and ad hoc reviewers at work for us. And we need to make sure in adjudicating each paper to send out that it's going to be worth their time and that you'll get high quality feedback. So you'll hear it again, but make sure that the first people to read your paper are not the reviewers and editor. Um, make sure your paper goes through lots of developmental feedback prior to sending it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, yes, we have a wide tent in the sense that we take um, all methods, all types of theory, all corners of the academy, all divisions and interest groups. Um, I'm a, a qualitative, uh, the, the qualitative deputy editor I handle only qualitative manuscripts, um, sometimes mixed methods, and about 18% of what we see are qualitative manuscripts coming in, and about 18% of what we publish are qualitative manuscripts. Um, and then the remaining 82% is about evenly split between micro and macro quantitative manuscripts. And again, our publication rate reflects what comes in. Um, impact factor is very high, we're very proud of that, um, and that's based on the work that people submit to us and it's high quality. Um, we have six issues per year. We have over 70 in-press articles. So when you do the math, you realize we have more than a year's worth of content already on the website available to be cited, to be read. Um, but uh, we have a healthy pipeline and our acceptance rate is running about 5% right now. So um, it is very uh, challenging to get your work published in AMJ, but when it does get published, that's a signal of how, how good quality it is. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a fantastic review board. I'm going to fly through the next few slides really quickly. This information is on our website and our editorial team came in a year ago. Um, but just so those of you who don't know sort of who we are and, and roughly what our expertise areas are, um, this is being recorded and these slides will be available after. But Laszlo Tiani, who's with us today, is our editor-in-chief. Um, and he's a macro international uh, strategy scholar. Um, Katie DeSellis is our micro deputy, deputy editor. Um, and she handles all of the micro um, manuscripts that come in and I'm the qualitative um, editor. Now, when I say handle, I mean, we pass them on to our team of another 20 AEs. So here they are. Um, and I'll just literally click through the slides so you can see some names and faces um, of the various editors and where they're coming from. Um, Many of them are here today. Some of them, for example, Bart, I think it's 3 a.m. for him, so he's not with us, but um, Ivona and, and Andrew are. And um, here's uh, just more of us coming through. And um, 
um, Daphne and Tamar are alphabetically lost. I will just point out for anyone who is keeping track, um, it, for the first time in uh, AMJ history, we have uh, more women than men who are acting as editors on this team. So we're quite proud of that and of Laszlo for creating a diverse team. Um, when your manuscript comes in through the door, the first person to touch it will be our fantastic managing editor who served AMJ for longer than any of us remember, Mike Malgrande, and he'll make sure that it looks and feels like a manuscript, that it's uploaded correctly, that it's not 100 pages long, etc. He'll pass it then to Laszlo, who makes the decision of whether this is a paper that deserves a full review, whether it needs to go back to the authors for maybe a light edit, it, maybe it's 65 pages and we really can't uh, look at a manuscript that that's, that's that long, but if you can cut it down in size, we'll take a look. So he makes the sort of first line of decisions. And then when we know that it will go to full review, it passes, as I mentioned, to one of the three of us, who will then have a look at it and choose um, who is the best on our team able to handle that topic um, or, or that method um, and who is available. So part of it is balancing. So you don't get a choice of who of which editor your paper goes to, um, but the deputy editors and Laszlo will, um, will make that decision based on um, their knowledge of the associate editors. Um, you get three reviews. Um, typically, on average, we would have two of those being editorial review board members, so people who do 10 to 12 reviews a year for us who have a long experience with AMJ in terms of their reviewing and also their authorship. And so they know the journal really well and they're selected because they give such high quality timely reviews. So you'll get very high level, um, uh, not high level, high quality reviewing. Um, usually, you know, it varies obviously with the reviewer, but um, so detailed comments, how you can improve your manuscript, constructive criticism, um, and they provide a recommendation to the editor, but it's the editors who make the decision on the manuscript. So they get guidance from the reviewers, but they also independently read the manuscript and will make a decision about whether this manuscript should be um, advanced to revision or not. Um, common, uh, as I mentioned, desk rejects are, are a high percentage of the manuscripts just because we receive so many uh, papers and some of which are just not suited for the journal and some of which the other common reasons for them being desk rejected are they're just not new. It's something we've seen before. It might sound new, but actually it might just be, you know, new language, for example, or arguments that have been well established. And so really aim to give your work that your most novel, most exciting and interesting and empirically sound work um, a go at AMJ. And um, because that's that's what we need to see is things that are are, are new and exciting and, and kind of cutting edge in that way. Um, obviously plagiarism or any other sort of um, thing like that would be an immediate grounds for desk rejection. Uh, desk edits, as I mentioned, are the kinds of things where we can see promise in the manuscript, but things need to be tidied up before it can be sent to the reviewers. Um, and uh, Denny and Ivona will get into this in much more detail, so I'm not going to dwell on that. I just want to spend the last couple of minutes I have with you to mention um, something that you might not be aware of. Um, the submission window is coming up soon, that's why I put it in such bold, and it's our special research forum entitled Joining Conversations in Society on Management and Organizations. Now, um, Laszlo and our team um, settled on this uh, over a year ago when we were incoming and had our first retreat. And I think we can all agree that it's only more timely to start orienting towards how we as management scholars can start to actually pick up on conversations that are happening in the world around the role of organizations and management in society. Um, and that can mean lots and lots of different things. Um, we, and we already have a rich um, amount of literature on certain issues, but other issues go systematically unattended to. Um, when you also think about people outside our field, what do they think about the issues that are most salient for organizations right now? They might be thinking about things that are very different to what we think and theorize about and think are the main conversations. So we're sort of calling on this um, on, on, you know, through this special issue to try to highlight um, areas of research, corners of inquiry that we think are, are, well, that others think are important to how we understand management and organizations and shine some light on those areas and show how there's opportunity for theory development. So really the um, opportunity here is to publish some papers that are quite cutting edge in terms of how they think about contemporary managerial problems. They might not have the full solutions, but they're going to shine some light on what these are and introduce topics to AMJ readers 
that might be again of interest to the wider community but not necessarily well taken up yet in the pages of ANJ. <laughs> These could be in relation to public policy, they could be in relation to um, <coughs> sorry, micro topics around diversity, inclusion, disability. Mm. Apologies, it's pollen season. So please have a look on this link if you're interested in that special issue. Okay, I do have a timer on <coughs> and I'm keeping roughly to my 15 minutes. Um, one last piece of information. So you're, you're likely at this uh, session because you're interested in how you publish your work in AMJ, but also um, when you submit a manuscript, you're automatically signed up as a reviewer for AMJ. We're always looking for people who want to serve as ad hoc reviewers. Um, and so there are some resources that are listed um, on the AOM website about um, both the tips for authors and tips for reviewers and what we're looking for. So direct yourselves to those. I will also mention that in past issues, and they're no longer on the website, but in past um, AMJ editorial teams, they've undertaken a large number of from the editors publications, which go into great detail about how to craft a manuscript for AMJ. So in addition to what you hear today from various editors, you should also take a look at these past um, FTEs or from the editors because they give great guidance on how do you think about an AMJ paper? How would you think about the introduction and the hook? How do you think about theorizing? How do you think about the methodology section? Um, what is qualitative research? How to do mixed methods? All sorts of important topics. So please um, have a look in past issues for those. And without further ado, I will hand the stage over to Ivana, who will talk about some tips for publishing from her perspective. Thanks. Oops. Ivana, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Sorry, I was muted and I did not even realize. Uh, so I'm going to just start sharing my screen now. I have a couple of slides in a few minutes. Mm. Sorry, guys. Um, sharing screen is not going well. I can see it just fine. If you just move through this, the, the, the slides without the, the, the presentation, it should work fine. Do you see it? Yeah. There you are. Now, yeah, we see it in presentation mode now. Okay, perfect. Sorry about this uh, technical glitch. So as Jen introduced me, my name is Ivona Hirek, and I'm at the Schulich School of uh, Business at York University, and I'm an AE on the micro side. So what I'm gonna share today is just a, a few observations I've observed over the past year about the common pitfalls and the major reasons for a rejection uh, at AMJ and what can we do or what authors can do to potentially to increase their chances to get an r, &R at AMJ. And some of these stuff that I'm gonna talk about today is not just unique to micro side. I think uh, authors across the range will probably relate to these things and probably some of these things are not as new. So the first thing that I always kind of start my rejections papers with is a motivation for the paper. So what this means that a lot of time it is not quite clear what is uh, the need for this paper and why do we need to know about this paper. Usually these authors get overly engaged, which is normal in our own research and we know it's important and we know why we need to study this, but that message is not really conveyed to a wider audience and we start wondering so why? And oftentimes it is is saying, uh, well, it hasn't been previously studied and the whole, it hasn't been previously studied, it's not enough of a compelling message or motivation. So I would urge authors to definitely think a little bit more about why is this important on a greater scale and why should people read about this and know about this phenomenon that we're studying. And related to motivation and the problem comes that it's not clear what the unique and novel contributions of this work if I don't know why I'm doing this, then the contributions consequently are not overly clear. And the highlight kind of related to that is that oftentimes you see that the work is not properly grounded in the, the past literature. Either you are tapping into 10 different literatures and it's really hard to know what's the literature you're trying to contribute to. Is it literature A, B, C, or D that you invoke? 
So simplicity sometimes is, is, a, is a more of a cure. So having a, a clearer picture and more simpler story, I would say, and tapping maybe into two or three literatures is enough. You don't need to cover all the possible literatures that have mentioned the topic of study, but being simple kind of brings the storyline in order and makes it more easier to follow. So this is usually the number one reason that I see why the papers uh, get rejected. And this is usually a writing issue where it is not quite clear why this is important. The next major thing is the theory development. And I think we all, including myself, struggle with this. What is theoretical development and what are contributions? But there are two main themes that I've observed uh, as, as I've been reviewing and as a reviewer, as an AE over the years. The first theme uh, refers to the lack of an overarching theoretical framework. So what I oftentimes see and what it sees is that there are a number of different variables or constructs invoked in the paper, but they don't hang together tightly. For example, you may have a mediation chain and then the, the, the relationship between the predictor and the mediator is explained by using theory X. And then to explain the chain or the link between the mediator and outcome, a very different theory is used, theory uh, Y. Uh, and they're not connected. So, so this kind of you invoking different kind of theories for different parts of your model or different parts of your model is leading to what we call fragmented theorizing. And it does not lead to this overarching story. It's not clear why this unique uh, constructs are invoked uh, in the paper. The other thing that I've observed is oftentimes there is no proper theoretical development in a sense of describing why certain relationships are supposed to exist. Oftentimes what I see uh, past research or researchers so and so has found this, hence I expect this. So the missing link here is why do you expect this in your own words, describe why do you expect this to exist. And I would, I would call this theorizing by citations. And the other problem with this is if past research has already shown this, so what is the novelty then in your work? So what is the novelty above and beyond to what you already cited? Just to keep in mind. So let's continue. Uh, so we obviously have a, a very high standards for methodology and methodological rigor. And one common theme that I've observed is the a lack of a match between theory and methods. And I do have one extreme example, which I do from time to time see so the theory in the front end is, for example, at a between uh, level variance and talks about between level phenomenon. And then we get to the methods and the methods used is experience sampling methodology, which is between a level variance. So there is no match. So if the, the, the panel is a between level, why would you use a between level methodology? And I have to admit, I've seen uh, quite my share of papers doing this. And I don't know if that's because people think that experience sampling methodology is a new, it's sexy, it's something to use, but whatever you end up using needs, even if it's just an old simple experiment and service that it needs to match to what theory it is. I would also suggest considering mixed methods because no single methodology is perfect. And I think we can all agree on that. And pairing up two methodologies tend to offset limitations of each one. Uh, and as I said, we are looking for bigger in design. And if you are not traditionally, so this is something I see as an experimentalist, if you are not traditionally, uh, and you don't traditionally use experiments, it is perhaps wise to, to maybe collaborate with somebody who does, or if you're using experience sampling methodology for the first time, maybe pairing up or collaborating with people who know how to do it would help to have a more vigorous design. And I would just uh, like to note a few things about comparing to message crafting. So one thing I would like to note is AMJ is encouraging all the authors to pay careful attention to transparency. And this is something that we've been trying to kind of uh, reinforce and emphasize this message. For the micro papers, this may include the following, uh, potentially considering, like we're not requiring this, but considering pre-registering studies and one platform to check is OSA. Disclosing uh, all manipulations, measures, and items, and drop observations, data stocking tools, et cetera. Uh, reporting results with covariates or transformations. And I would also urge authors to consider replication of your findings. A lot of times you see a paper with only one study, which invokes in the issues of robustness of your data and replicability issues. 
final note I would like to note is on crafting a message. So what is the takeaway message you would like to give to your audience? And a lot of times, uh, and maybe this is given the PLN, yeah, which is diversity, inclusion, and equality. I, I see sometimes troubling messages where you found that, you know, discrimination leads to better performance, for example. Uh, or, you know, messages that perhaps they don't have a social responsible angle, and maybe there is even no data group to back it up. So I would suggest an orange authors to carefully think about the message they're giving out and how that message is helping our society and organizations and how we can craft our messages that are socially responsible and are, we are actually helping our society to become better. So, so, some, so, so a little bit about that is something, you know, a thought uh, for maybe some of the papers. So also I do have some additional resources that tap into some particular identified issues that talked about motivation theory and methods. And with that, I would just like to thank you for listening and uh, we will continue this conversation at breakout session and during our Q and A. And I will hand it over to the new respond. Thank you, Ivana. So uh, I'll do a, a similar type of presentation, uh, but quickly I want us to uh, move on, move to the, uh, the breakout session. So allow me to just share my screen if I can. Here we are. So now you should see only my. Um, yeah, you should you should be able to see that. So what I've done is I've uh, I've uh, I've looked at the, uh, the the decision letters that I've written uh, in the past year or so, and, and I've highlighted. You know, as reviewers tend to highlight the most important reservations they have. I've sort of. Uh, did did a, a short uh, frequency analysis on this. So of the all the the rejected manuscripts that I've seen over the past year, uh, all of I mean the poor framing was never uh, uh, the first issue mentioned. Limited theoretical import. We by that it was often uh, hypotheses that were very obvious, tautology, these kind of things. Sometimes the, the the reviewers would signal a lack of a theoretical, theoretical contribution is in a sense that essentially what the paper was trying to do is a simple application of something that's very, very well known to a new context. Uh, the, the more critical issues were issues of theory and method misalignment, meaning that even if the hypothesis had some potential, the data was just not able to to to, to provide information on this. And, and, and oftentimes another issue was that the logic, the mechanics explaining the, uh, the, uh, the, the issues were not there. So in, in many ways, it's akin to what Ivana was saying about uh, arguing by citations. Um, if, if, I, if I include also the second uh, reason that was highlighted, we see a similar uh, pattern here. If I compare with the manuscripts that were extended uh, an offer to revise and resubmit, we see that the, the limited theoretical import was, uh, was um, somewhat less frequent. The lack of a theoretical contribution was never an issue, but we still had issues of theory misalignment and, and sometime underdeveloped uh, logic. What, what, uh, what's, uh, what's important to understand here is that the issues in these different groups of paper were, were, were simply not as big. So in, in some of the, in, in, in all the papers that were, that received an invitation to revise and resubmit, the reviewers saw a path forward. So it's not only that the issues were necessarily different, but the scope of the issues was, was smaller. And so, so reviewers were confident that, yeah, perhaps it's worth investigating this paper a little bit more. So, uh, in the, um, in the breakout room uh, session, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the strategies that I've seen reviewers and, and uh, propose to, to handle this, but some of this will, 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 uh, will uh, focus on, on stating the assumptions that, that uh, support your theorizing. Uh, I'll talk about how the methods uh, fit the, the, uh, the, uh, the hypothesis, uh, developing the, 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 the rhetoric for, uh, for the, uh, the hypothesis, and explaining the why for those those logic, uh, and so we'll, we'll, I'll develop some of that. I also want to talk about the uh, observation I've had with respect to the the overall message, and this is where we focus perhaps a little bit more on on the discussion. Many of the discussions among the the, the papers that were not invited to submit a, a, a revised version, uh, essentially the discussion repeated what was already found. So it was like seeing the results section a second time. Sometime uh, you had papers that tried to position uh, their, their message against prior literature, but 
still focus on what they what the paper did without necessarily uh, arguing for what the paper is adding uh, meaning the contribution uh, we had some papers eight percent that began uh, developing this but uh, there were other issues that prevented uh, an invitation to R and R. If we compare that to the the manuscripts that were invited for an R and R, overwhelmingly the vast majority of them were trying to position that we had fewer uh, manuscripts that were only repeating the results, uh, and uh, and we even had some that were actually a, a pretty solid uh, start on this. So again, here what I don't want to focus so much on the frequency as a group, but but uh, but. What, when, what, what was a distinguishing feature of those manuscripts that received an invitation to r and r was that they, they were on average they were trying a little bit more to to expand uh, their message uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll I'll talk about, about that a little bit more um, a couple other things that perhaps uh, is more than meets the eye one distinguishing feature of the the manuscript that extended that were uh, that received an invitation to r and r in general there was a uh, a somewhat richer, deeper take on the phenomenon, the real life phenomenon that they were trying to, to, to understand better. And so with this, this deeper conceptualization of the work, it was easier for the authors to start thinking about what, what good data could match this very rich phenomena I'm trying to, uh, that we're trying to, 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 uh, to study. So, so in this sense, a lot of those uh, R&R manuscripts simply felt richer, deeper, more substantive and in both the theory and the method side. So that's something that, that, that suggests. That doesn't mean that to publish an AMJ one absolutely need a cool data set, but, but it helps when you've gone into this, this deeper dive on trying to understand what's in 2020, what's, what's, what do we understand about this real life phenomenon? How can we mod, uh, model this conceptually in, with more substance and in, in somewhat deeper fashion? And, and where can we find data that, that really speaks of this? So on the data front, uh, when you have a stronger conceptualization of the phenomenon, it sort of challenges the authors to, to go deeper. And if you are, so for instance, if you're using archival data, you, you draw some data from Crunchbase or, or some other databases and, and you try then to, 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 to do some sort of transformation of this data to really get at, at the meaning of, of the real life phenomenon. And in order to do that, you need to explain the assumptions that guided your method. So, so by, by going in circle uh, across the entire paper, you end up going deeper. If I may uh, share one last insight from my, my one year trip uh, as a as, a, as an AE4 AMJ, I just want to share the number of authors who actually, when, when I sent a decision, a uh, number of authors who actually acknowledged receiving a decision. And then I've, I've actually talked to my, my colleagues on this. And so the number of author is uh, the kanji symbol for zero. And you can guess that the number of authors who actually thank the reviewer is also zero, yet, the number of you viewers who got back to me uh, about the the letters, the comment they see in in in, in other reviewers' letter, I need more than two hands to actually count that. So it looks like the reviewers are actually reading the letters, but as an associate editor, I don't always get the impressions that the author are 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 thankful. In 15 years reviewing papers and seeing a thousand reviews, not that I've done a thousand reviews, but I've seen uh, some of uh, the other reviewers uh, their letters. I've only seen a handful of reviews that were three word long. Like, okay, this is sad, three words. Uh, viciously hostile reviews, again, a handful of those. Plain wrong reviews, reviews that don't make any sense. I've, I've, I've very rarely seen this. Um, the vast majority of reviews that I've seen, they, they usually included very useful observations that, that were trying to make the, the, the manuscript better. And if you think about it, they were all offered for free, yet, if we want to think about the, the economic problem or the economic cost of providing these reviews, I mean, you're, you get three reviewers plus my time. We usually take, you know, on average, anywhere between two and seven hours to, to craft those reviews. If you think about the hourly rate of these, and not me, because I'm, I guess I'm cheap, but some of the people I end up roping on, on the, the team of expert reviewers for these papers, I mean, their, their time, if they do consulting, is, is not high. So if we were to frame that in, in economic terms, the cost of providing a review at AMJ, just the salary time of the reviewers, is anywhere between three and 5,000 US dollars. Uh, add to that the cost of the manuscript central system, the AMJ, uh, 
you know, you, you get a lot of good advice uh, and, and you get that for free. So if, if I may make a, a suggestion, it's just a simple email, uh, three points, I acknowledge receiving the decision letter, please extend our thanks to the reviewers and we'll try to integrate their observation for future iterations. Many of us on the associate editor board, we were trained that way, but we were somewhat surprised on our first year that, that so few authors were actually getting back to us with some, some, some positive feedback. And, and I think it's important because Again, there's, there's, there's value in the reviewer's feedback, even if sometimes it's, it's difficult, the decision is disappointing, but, but, but sending out this email is, is a sign that you've actually, in, you're, you're, you're trying your best to, to integrate some of that feedback. And so I thought that uh, after talking to my colleagues, I thought that I would, would take these brief moments to, to, to draw uh, the attention of, 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 all, of, all of, of all of us on this, this simple email. Uh, I know I would love to see those emails, and, and, and I've, I'm also mentioning that in the doctoral consortium training that I mentioned. So with that said, uh, let's move to the breakout rooms. Uh, owing to the, the, the different uh, limitations of the, uh, uh, of the current setup, what we've decided to do, we wanted to, to make the, uh, the breakout room session as, as, as close to the real life experience of attending the Academy of Managers as possible. So it means that you as participant would probably want to select which breakout room you want you want to go to and if you go to one that even if it, it's super interesting what what the person is saying it, it's too crowded you can't hear anything then in a physical space you would be able to move to another room so what i've just d done is i've published on the uh the uh the academy of management conference the the, the on, in your schedule there's a there's a page for the for this pdw i've just posted uh the list of breakout rooms, which I can describe here as well. So we're going to have nine breakout rooms focusing on uh, publishing micro qualitative research, setting up the contribution, general tips for publishing, uh, research on diversity, social justice, and experimental methods, psych theory, qualitative research. I apologize, there's a typo there. I thought I'd corrected that. Uh, articulating the, develop, the theory development, crafting the message and motivation. So you're, you're gonna have a choice of, of which breakout room you will attend. Uh, and I've just posted uh, on that PDW and perhaps I could, what I could do is, is uh, stop sharing if I can. I quick, um, quick yes, question. go ahead. Um, and I don't mean to single her out, but I see Lindy's name listed and I, I'm not sure I've sent seen Lindy among us. Lindy, could you unmute yourself and just say hi uh, so that we don't send people? Thanks for reminding me. Uh, Lindy is currently in a different breakout room and won't be able to join us just uh, yet. Uh, but she will be there, she told me, in at four at 30 at 140. So she should be there Perfect. momentarily. Brilliant. Uh, okay. So right. so participants can select any of those available. Um, excellent. Yes, yes. Uh, and right now I'm trying to uh, unshare my screen. And because I'm using this setup, hold on. All right. Uh, there it is. Sorry. There we are. So, uh, okay. Are, I'm assuming that people are able to see the uh, their schedule, and so I don't need to share this. Or so just just for clarity, what we're doing is asking you to go to the session. Yeah, this where you signed in. Copy and in a moment when we're ready, copy and paste that new Zoom link in you'll find that um, associate editor in that room with you. You'll have until 2.15 Eastern in the breakout, but then we all need to come back again. And we've been assured that this link will still be open, but you will probably need to navigate back and go through the, the main conference website. Um, we hope it all works because we do intend to do Q&A after the breakout sessions. Um, it, it but it we, will we work. Need you to move. Yeah, it will work. But we need you to move. We're not going to move you because normally with breakout rooms, you get moved. So just understand that you need to proactively go to one of these other links and then come back to this link that we're all on now. All and right. It will so, work. so as you see, like if you if you get back to the page, you can actually just click on this 
and, and will allow you to get back. And when you want to get back with us, and we said what, at 2.30 at or 2.15, Jennifer? Um, we're going to wrap up the breakout rooms at 2.15 because it looks like we're in good time. So and at, yeah. at 2.15, if you click, you'll be back to get back to this page and you click join meeting, we'll, we'll all be right back together. Yeah. Sounds good. So let's do that. I, I if you have any question. questions, stay on this Zoom here, and ask here, here in our question. Yes, sorry. I for some reason I don't see the link to Zoom breakout rooms when I go to that page. Just refresh it. Refresh it? Okay, I'll try. Thank you. I'll hang out here a little bit just in case, uh, Jen. Perfect. Thanks. And if the other AEs can go and navigate to your breakout and have fun, and we'll see you all back here in about 40 minutes, 35. All right, unless there are any questions on the people still on this call, there's about 40 people still on this call. Unless you raise a hand, and single questions, I will move to my own uh, private breakout rooms. All right. In Sorry. Three. Yes. Super embarrassed, but uh, I, I just can't find it. And uh, if you go into the Academy of Management conference schedule, and if you click, if you enter the, the place where you, there's this PDW, I mean, you registered for this PDW, so it is on your schedule. If you go there on that page, I shared my screen earlier and you should be able to see it. I would like to go to uh, session number one. Do you have the link available probably? I don't have, unfortunately the Academy doesn't provide the, uh, the chat in Zoom. So I can't, the only thing I can do is send you to that, uh, uh, that schedule. That's the only place, I'm really sorry. Unless you can type very fast, because it's, it's nah. I just can't, it's too long a link. Okay, don't worry, it's fine. You do an excellent try, job. Try to, try to go to the, the, the schedule, but we'll understand. I mean, it's been a nightmare, <laughs> but. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Susan from the Academy. If you go back to um, this session on, on the Academy site, and you go into polls, I think, and- Perfect, Susan. Excellent. Again, Susan is doing perfect here. And Thank then you. go yes. under um, which breakout room topic would you most like to attend? You should see a listing, and you should be able to go to the breakout that you want to go to. Yeah, just excellent. Thank you. I found it. Perfect, Susan. Thank you again. All Pleasure. the best from Germany. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Hello, um, I have a question. Go ahead. So I'm not sure if you have to be registered for this um, PDW in order to uh, join the breakout room because it says that it requires a password. Uh, I don't think it should require yes. a password. Okay, that's a bit strange then. Um, if you, maybe try another one. The organizers okay. who set it up aren't in here right now. They're in the breakout rooms. So if you can get into another one, maybe you could ask about it, but there shouldn't be a password on any of them. Okay, thanks. I'll try a different one.
So Joel, I have a question for you. Sure. I'm trying to upload the files, the, the PowerPoints um, to the session and it's just really slow. Is that the norm or is that? Are you referring to like on the files tab on the website? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that has to do with the amount of traffic the website's currently getting. So because okay. so many attendees and stuff are going on and off, that's, that's why it's so slow. Okay. I'll be patient. Thanks. You're welcome.
<clears throat> Hello there. Anyone there? Yes. Hey, Joel. Uh, how can I get to the breakout rooms? Okay, so if you go to where you signed up for this session on the AOM webpage, yeah. there's a chat box. And yeah. in that chat box, it should list it. I was um, just there. No information, actually. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, did you try reloading the page? Let me see. No. Maybe that's why, but I just open it. Let me check. Um, I tried, but still doesn't work. Could I make a suggestion? Go under, go back to the page on the AOM site. Go under polls. And then okay. from there, scroll down to what particular, um, scroll down. To uh, I got it. I just got the links now in okay. the chat. Thank you. You're Appreciate. welcome. So See for the later. other Bye. person with this question, which breakout topic room would you most like to attend? Click on vote and you'll see it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Joel, didn't mean to speak over you. Oh, no, that's fine. Please do. Oh. Hmm. That's not 
Hey, I just noticed, I don't think my solution works. Oh, well. Yeah, I was messing with it and I couldn't figure it out, but it seemed to work for someone somehow. I know people went away happy, but I just tried it and it didn't work for me. I, I think, think maybe... it's more just a genuine vote. Yeah, I think so. switching tabs on that between chat and the vote maybe refreshes it and that's what fixes it for them i'm not sure okay okay oops well somebody ran away happy but
All right, I see some familiar faces here. Lindy, it's good to see you back with the rest of us. Yeah, sorry to join late. I was in the conflict management PhD consortium before this, but I made it for the breakout. We had a fun discussion. It was nice to see everyone. Wonderful. It looks like most of the breakout rooms were able to uh, to work. I, I sort of hung out. There were still some, some people who were struggling. I think Susan uh, eventually took over. Uh, thank you, Susan. And I take it that Jen and Ivana will join us momentarily. So um, I have just joined, but I am trying to rename myself. You don't want to be host 500? I will be host 500, but it's a bit confusing because there's another one at least. Um, so one difficulty we have in the private breakout rooms, we add uh, an ability to do chat. Uh, in the large room here, we don't have chat. So in order to handle questions and answer, uh, we will need to ask people to use on, if you click on participants, you're gonna see a list of people and there should be a hand raise function. Uh, if you're not a host, you should have that. Uh, and so we'll do it that way. Uh, Jen, do you want me to do a MC and handle traffic? That Thanks. would be brilliant, yeah. And I think we're all trying to navigate various Zoom configurations. So thank you all the participants for, and Denny especially for our, and I hope everyone's gotten back here. Um, my chat room was a little. We have 95 we had uh, in the hundreds uh, earlier. Yeah, we've had a little attrition, but that's okay. That's fine. Um, okay, so, um, I can't see the hands raised, but Denny, if you. All right. Uh, can one participant, someone who's not an, uh, an associate editor, do you have the hand raised? Yes, it, it seems that it's working, right? Okay, okay, it works, good. So if you're a participant, this is the part where we're all back into a sort of, some sort of plenary session. There's a, there's a lot of expert uh, on, on board. So I invite, if you want to ask a question, to, to anyone on the team, uh, you, could, you could name the person you would first like to, to answer the question. It could be Laszlo as the editor, it could be one of our uh, deputy editor, it could be a specific associate editor. Just mention that in your question and we'll give the floor to that person. If you don't name someone, then it will be uh, the first AE who wants to do it, they will, uh, they will jump in. So, um, who wants to ask a first question? All right, so Anna Maria Brumus, you have the floor. Hello, thank you so much for this session to all of you. My question is, I guess in general, about the pre-registration process. So for people who maybe already have a project in progress, is it still valuable to engage in that pre-registration process or is this something only to uh, start at the very beginning of your project? Thank you. Who wants to take this one? Uh, I can, I can. Ivona. Um, so it is, so thank you for bringing up this very important question uh, as we move to uh, an age of transparency at ANJ. It is absolutely valuable at any stage, I would say, to engage in a process of pre-registration. It doesn't need to be uh, at the beginning of the project. And we are all learning, you know, as time passes and we, we're all evolving. So I would say if you would like to register subsequent studies, that's totally okay um, without having the previous pre-registered. And for the ANJ purposes, we are not requiring pre-registration and you should not forgo your previous studies. But you, throughout the process, we may ask you for any subsequent studies to be pre-registered. We, we are acknowledging that people are, that we're still in this learning boat where we're still kind of learning how this works, what we're supposed to do. So, so and we are here to learn together. So if nobody's gonna say that this is not a good data because it was not pre-registered, but it is something that you could start thinking, it looks like you're starting to think about for future studies. I hope that, that answers questions and maybe some other AEs have something else to add. Thank you, Maria, for this. Thank you, Ivana. Anyone else wants to uh, ask a question to the panel? Should be a question. I'm sorry. 
I have a question on um, ethics of publication. What is the line of uh, the salami publication? My students normally ask me that and I, I have a very hard question. How, how, how do you how do you treat your data? I mean, how do you reuse other da data from your or other uh, source uh, data from other sources, and and what's the limit for that? So, if I understand correctly, you're asking about. Uh, reusing data that has been published in another paper or that's been used in another context, right? Yes. All right, I saw Laszlo was about to move a hand. So Laszlo, do you want to take this one? So we would like to publish original work. So this is very important uh, for us. So uh, if, if you published any other articles or you have uh, papers under review from the same uh, data set, um, we would like to get a copy of that uh, paper or article so we can evaluate, uh, um, you know, normally we work together with the deputy editors and then later with the associate editors to see whether your work is novel enough beyond the contribution that you made with your uh, paper from the same data set in other, other um, journals. So. Again, the originality is very important for us. We, we would not like to publish, you know, these salami sliced uh, articles when, when uh, people add a moderator or change the control variable becomes the, suddenly the um, independent variable. So, so it is very important for us that we publish original work. So, and how do, you, how do we make this other papers or this other work available, especially if they, they are under review to the editors? Uh, we would like you to uh, submit with your, uh, so, so when you upload your uh, uh, submission, um, there is an area for cover letter. In a cover letter, you can explain it, uh, you can compare in a table, for example, the differences, and you can also submit a you know, this working paper, attach it as with your submission. Those, that will not be sent out to the reviewers, but uh, we would like to uh, take a look at this other paper. Thank you, uh, Laszlo. Uh, Maria, uh, Maria, you still have a hand raised. Uh, was this a second question? All right. Uh, Maria Dolores? Dolores. Uh, are you talking about me? Sorry. All yes. right. Yes, I, I, am, I am thinking if uh, AMJ is a good outlet to introduce a new topic of, ma of management or maybe on management. Because, for instance, I'm trying to write about vulnerability as the main comparing finding. I, I find my fieldwork and how to deal with it in organizations. And I hear Jennifer talking about vulnerability in, at the keynote of Vigos, but I don't know if it's a, a good way to introduce a new topic or to try to introduce a new topic, send it to AMJ. I don't know if maybe another route <laughs> to do something like that. I'm happy to put in my two cents on this and, and we were just in the room together, but I, th I think um, all of us would encourage, you know, the, the entire journal is about novel, novelty, novel theory. Um, and so we're not just looking for, you know, building the next little brick in the wall on institutional theory, for example, which there are many more bricks in the walls to come, but that's not picking on that theory. That said, um, it's really important to know that you're entering into a conversation with readers of the journal. And so if you're introducing a completely novel concept, um, they will anchor in priors. And so the notion of vulnerability, while we might label it that and we might say we don't have a 
theory of vulnerability. Actually, we have lots and lots of theory that engages with the concept of vulnerability or certainly engages with concepts of lack of vulnerability or th that are related. And author, uh, you know, readers, reviewers will very quickly pick up on what related conversations we have going on. So it's your job actually as an author to, to bring this new thing to us in a way that we can receive it. So in a way that we both understand it and kind of anchor it in what we are currently talking about and see, but also in a way that we see its possibilities. And so that is challenging to do, but it, it involves sort of seeing your work not as disconnected to, but as building on a current conversation. Um, and maybe Heather, as a, as a, um, you just popped up. Um, I don't mean to pick on you, but as a micro AE might want to add something on, you know, was it another qualitative AE? And anyone else? I, was say, I don't think I have much to add. I think that, that Jen said it very nicely that, you know, as an author, it's your job to, to pick up on the pre-existing conversations and, and to, to speak to those. And again, I do want to reiterate that I think AMJ is absolutely a place for new concepts and, and new ideas, but they very rarely is something going to be so new that nobody has ever touched on it in any way, shape or form in the past. So you do have to make those linkages, but please send your new exciting ideas this way. <laughs> Just to yes and both of those comments, because those are wonderful answers. You also, at least for me as an AE, my life is easier the more that you can help identify the specific conversation you think the new idea will speak to. Because sometimes with a new idea, like with vulnerability, you can say, okay, it speaks to the work on emotions, it speaks to the work on um, humility, it speaks to the work on authenticity. And reviewers in each of those dialogues will have very different assumptions and criteria for publication. And so as much as I would want your paper to get published, if the three reviewers have very fundamentally different reactions that are not aligned, so when re one reviewer say they're coming from the emotions world, they believe in lab experiments, and when you do a lab experiment, and the authenticity person wants you to do more, another round of qual data collection, it's very hard for me to get your paper through. So the more that you can choose which specific audience of like 10 to 15 people, like that precise, a symposium and academy that this new idea would fit into, the easier it'll be for me to help you get reviewers who are gonna align and help me be on a team with you to get the same through to the end of publication. Thank you all for these uh, detailed answers. Thank you, Maria, for the questions. The next one would be Nadine Bienefeld. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I was just wondering if you could allude a little bit more and say maybe potential themes for the special issue, because I have a qualitative paper in preparation that I would like to submit that might fit because I'm investigating AI in ICU healthcare teams, uh, automation and, and trust and the kind of the whole story, which is highly acute in the, in the current world debate. So if you could maybe say something about what, what topics you have in mind for that special issue. And maybe we'll go directly to Jennifer as it's a qualitative paper. Thank you. I was trying to, was trying to point at Laszlo on that one. Um, Laszlo, do you want to say a few words about the special issue first? Because I'm happy to say something, but I just wanted to give okay. you the opportunity. Well, well, certainly we are very excited about this special issue and and um, I believe it's it's quite broad and, and certainly you're right, the current crisis and, and, and very likely we're hoping that we, we're going to get many interesting papers that answer some of the questions that's been raised recently, but there are, you know, many, many other problems in the society and hopefully we'll, you know, these, these submissions will, uh, you know, cover some of those. And just maybe one more thing that, you know, the, we, we're going to use the same criteria. We are looking for interesting papers, but very strong, uh, theoretically grounded research consistent with the expectations of AMJ. Turn it over to Jen. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I agree, Nadine, it's, um, it sounds like just from the headline, there's a lot of pieces of your work that could fit. Um, I think 
what we're looking to do is, um, you know, so there is some work on AI or, or precursors to AI, certainly um, in various divisions of the academy and in various journals, including ours. Um, but what are the questions that haven't been raised within our journals? And what are the ways of theorizing and seeing these questions that are important in the real world, but we might not have picked up on? And I think, you know, it doesn't shock any of us to talk about issues of privacy. And like you said, issues of trust, issues of, of, of you know, efficacy um, in cases where human lives are on the line, for example. Now, we as organizational theorists, it's not that we don't care about those, but the tools that we're using to theorize and the, the modes in which you've been theorizing might not have exposed us to these kinds of questions that might be very, very salient to organizational members and, you know, people who engage with organizations. So I think that's what we're trying to emphasize, which is just opening our eyes a little bit more widely to concerns that that we can engage with and that we can ha hopefully expand our conversation as scholars um, with the community of people who are affected by these, uh, you know, like you said, changes in technology, changes in ways of doing things. Um, so, uh, yeah, and we'll use the same criteria, you know, we want to enter a conversation, but we also want to show that this is a conversation that actually we've been missing to some degree. So we're, we're looking with that special issue to be a bit more expansive and open. Um, I think I think also, uh, you know, Laszlo and I have been on the team two years ago where we started talking about grand challenges. The last team um, that wrapped up in, in 2019 was talking about new ways of seeing. So this is a continuation on a trend of how um, our journal anyway has been viewing you know the role of management research so uh, it's not a massive break but it is an expansion go for it thanks thank you laszlo nadine and jen uh the next question would be uh from praveen shugatan if you could please unmute yourself praveen so my question is like what is the scope of amj so when I look through the journal and the kind of articles or in the, um, in the journal about session, mostly it says that it's about management theory. So what do we mean by management? Do we also like uh, publish or are you open to uh, more like, like fields, like subfields from management, like marketing, like so how do you manage consumer groups or how do you manage uh, value of customers? How do you uh, like, uh, manage maybe the like supply chain? All this, all this also becomes important or like relevant topics to you. Perhaps I could uh, I could take this one uh, unless someone else wants to. Uh, the, the 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 simpler answer I would offer is if you if you look at your you're attending the Academy of Management conference. The Academy of Management as as a number of divisions that uh, that give you a sort of an idea of, of the, the the different topics that are of interest to micro and macro scholars interested in the the broad managerial sciences but in this regard you might see that there's no marketing division there's no finance division now it doesn't mean that you can't publish uh, papers that have uh, that draw from finance theory or from marketing theory but they will need to make a contribution to a phenomenon that's understood from the lens of some of the divisions. So, so an easy way to answer your question is that MMJ is not close to any of, of, of topics as long as they are relevant to the uh, the divisions of the academy. Because at the end of the day, AMJ is is a is is a member uh, journal. Okay, so like as I understand, the scope is limited to the divisions. Like, so whatever is outside I, the divisions, I, I would not say limited, but it's this is this uh, journals have to have not so much limits as to focus. And so what what defines this the focus of AMJ is on that. Uh, if you're interested in, in in marketing issues, the conversations of relevance will take place in in other journals. Uh, any other AE want to uh, tackle this one? If not, I would recommend, I thank you, uh, Shobit, for your question. I would move to uh, Pavel Kral. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question on an issue that's been mentioned several times today, 
Uh, what are the key indicators of uh, which, uh, differ uh, which differentiate between convincing theorizing and theoriz theorizing by citations? Is it the providing the mechanism or suggesting why or, or anything else? Thank you. Anyone want to take this one? I guess I could start taking this up and maybe others can join me. So the first, what I meant, so this was something in my presentation, what I meant by this, that what I'm seeing is clearly there is a lack of description for why you expect so that certain relationship exists. If your hypothesis is the A is going to lead to more or increase in B, why? Just in plain words. So that's what I meant. Like oftentimes, you know, we expect this increase because of A, B, C, or D, or just A. What I oftentimes see is that, you know, previous researchers have found that A leads to B, but there's no mention of why. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to study that why. It needs to be a variable that's empirically examined, but needs to be described. Why, like, why do you, in other words, why do you expect this relationship to exist in the first place beyond that, that other researchers have potentially found similar relationships? So, so that will be, it's, it's very basic and just basically telling me story why we should expect this in, in plain words, in your own words, if that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. Anybody else would like to join in this one? I, I would add to that that one common place where I see this is people saying that um, so-and-so says this is an important question to study and or, um, you know, researchers have called for the study of this topic with six citations after that. Um, and what I would rather see, that's, that's great that others have said it's an important problem, but what I would like to see is a clear explanation of why it's important, uh, why it's consequential, what um, what uh, uh, consequences of interest are actually impacted by the question. And so um, it's not just deferring to what others have said, but instead really explaining clearly the why. Thank you, Andrew Ivana. Thank you, Pavel. Don't, s all right, so let's move on. Ti Lan Nguyen, that's the next question. Thank you very much. I have two questions. Um, the first is, um, is student samples is less interesting with uh, AMJ? And the second is, um, do you sometimes invite the same reviewers at others? Because I receive the reviewers the, exactly the same from two journals. So that's why I don't know if whether uh, and I am Jade, invite the same reviewers from uh, as other or not. Thank you very much. All right, should I? I'll, I'll volunteer for this. The issue of student samples first. Um, in, in, in the field that I'm most associated with, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, the issue of sample has been abundantly uh, debated because it's difficult to study entrepreneurs. Uh, if you think about it, they're, they're rare. There's been studies among the populations anywhere between, depending on the countries, anywhere between three and 10% of the population is, is at time involved in, in a startup, but the extent of their involvement, the extent of their engagement will vary from, yeah, I've, I've thought of starting a startup when I, you know, five, five minutes before I go to bed, or, or, or I spend 80 hours trying to develop this startup, right? So it's difficult to, to, to do interviews or surveys with entrepreneurs. So because of that, as a fallback, throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, scholars would study entrepreneurs, uh, business students who would contemplate perhaps uh, launching a career in entrepreneurship. And so the current state of the field, at least on the entrepreneurship side, and, and I'll use that as an example to, to, to discuss for AMJ. The current state of the field in entrepreneurship, as my understanding anyway, is that it depends what you're studying. But if you're trying to understand the career choices of students, then student samples are perfectly acceptable. The chance of publishing that will be higher in a vocational journal than than in a management science journal because the phenomenon you're trying to model is not an organizational i mean it's very distant 
from an organizational uh, phenomenon. So you see where I'm going with this. Student samples are going to be interesting, whether for micro or macro, as long as this, the students you're describing are engaged in, in something that speaks to a, an organizational managerial phenomenon. And then it depends on the different uh, the domains of, of academy, how much the reviewers will push back as whether the student experience of this phenomenon is, is a good enough approximation of what takes place in a real life organization. But that's for a debate for down the road. The first criteria is, is the, the student samples that you're using, are they engage in, in some sort of task exercise situations that, that speaks of an organizational reality? And then the criteria, of course, will be whether you make a, a, a contribution to theory and things like that. So the, 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 short, uh, the short answer to, the, to your first question is, student samples are not a, a no, no, absolutely. There's no rule that prevents you it, but it's up to you to make the case that your use of student sample is actually relevant for the phenomenon you're studying and for the conversation you want to engage with, with AMJ. So that was my short answer on the first question. Uh, anyone wants to take the second question? I can take the second question. So if I understand correctly, you're asking um, if we sent, we'll send a paper out to the same reviewers that have seen it at a separate journal. Is that correct? Is that the, that was the question? Um, we have no idea who's seen your paper before. We we don't have that information. We don't know what reviewers have seen it. No, no, so, so, oh, sorry, okay. I interrupt you a little bit. Um, okay. Because, you know, the first, uh, we send a paper to the one journal, we recheck, and then okay. we, send, we send to another journal, also recheck, but also, you know, we receive reviewer exactly the same from right. two journals. So that's why right. you ask if whether, you know, journal invite the same, yeah. So we don't know who's done it before. So we, that, that does not steer our decision making because we have we do not have that information. However, as Lindy was mentioning, these conversations are oftentimes 10 to 15 people, right? Like, you know, we, there's, these are narrow conversations that are being had. So the likelihood of it being sent to another reviewer is, I mean, it's not super high, but it's certainly possible and it definitely happens regularly. And so I think the insight there, or one insight to take away is that if you get reviews from a journal, take them seriously, listen to them, respond to them, make changes in your paper, address those issues, the ones that are helpful before you send it somewhere else. Because, and I'm not saying that you didn't do that, I'm just saying as a general rule, because otherwise, if you get the same reviewer again at a different journal, they're gonna have the same response and they're gonna be kind of annoyed that, that you didn't listen to them the first time. So we don't, we don't, make decisions on who it goes to based on any information except for what you send us in the paper but you do have a responsibility to make sure you're not just sending the same paper out over and over without making changes oh, i would add on that is that um usually the reviewer who has seen it before will respond to the editor and say i've seen this paper already i've already reviewed it um uh do you still want me to review the paper and, uh, and so it's something that the reviewers will s usually say, I've already seen this, so that at least there's transparency that they've seen the paper before. But especially the members of AMJ's board will say, I've seen this paper before, I think I can give it a fresh read, they'll say that, or if they think they can't, they'll say, you probably should let this fly um, to a different reviewer who can give it a fresh, a fresh look. And so um, I, I think, Heather's point is a really important one of responding and incorporating suggestions that reviewers have taken the time to make because uh, for the top set of journals in management, there are a set of reviewers on that topic who are the top people and odds are you're going to draw those folks uh, as you move from journal to journal. Jen, did you want to add something or? No, thank you, Andrew. I just was going to say that, um, you know, the quality of reviewer and the quality of journal are correlated. And I'm not saying anything, uh, you know, about that, but the, but as Andrew pointed out, most of our reviewers, especially editorial review board members would alert us if they've seen a paper previously. Um, so it, there's, a, there's a concern, you know, there's, there's 
something on both sides. As an author, it's your obligation to take that reviewer, the reviewer's comments on board. And as a reviewer, there's an obligation to take a fresh look at the paper if, if they believe that it's going to take a fresh look. And, and we, just so you know that um, editors are in touch with reviewers, um, you know, back and forth on, on queries like this regularly. So we do work very hard to make sure that everybody is clear about what's going on and um, we're not just shuttling your paper through a process. It's a good question though, thanks for raising it. Thank you. Uh, so the next question on the, uh, the chat here would be from uh, Shobit. Do you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question please? Yeah, hi, hi, Ernest, thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding one of the points uh, which were there in the presentation that the motivation of the study should have a greater impact uh, it should have a wider application. Uh, so I want uh, uh, the, the panel to elaborate a more on more about it, uh, because many times in qualitative studies the context is very limited. For example, if I have to if I have to do a research on how software project managers take decisions, so it it will appear that that the context is very small. It's only about software project management, but it is possible that. The same, uh, the, the findings, the theoretical elaboration that happens from that study might be applicable to various different domains. So, it, so for, for the author, it has a wider application. So how uh, the author can convey or communicate the same to the reviewers through in, in the manuscript? Anyone wants to take this one? I know Luis uh, yesterday had a, had a panel or a breakout room on, on motivations. I don't know if he's still with us. Doesn't appear so. Anyone else wants to take the, uh, seems to be a question about qualitative intros. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take that, um, uh, but please others should chime in. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, with qualitative work in, in particular, we don't ever want to use the word generalize. We're not use, looking for, for universal law here. Uh, the, the value of qualitative work is that you're pulling from a very specific context and, and sort of engaging with it very deeply. Um, but we want transferable work. We want, to, we want your study to be able to say, I found this phenomena or I found these mechanisms, I found this process unfolding or this set of relationships. Um, within the software development engineers that another reader could say, oh, that's really interesting. I'm studying something quite different, but I see that same phenomena because, because they're humans, because they're a team, because they're an organization. And so that's where the, the sort of notion of how can I lift out of my data and my study something that other researchers will find resonance with and will be able to transfer to another setting and deepen their explanation of something. And that thing then is the theoretical vehicle. Um, so motivation isn't just, um, I think software managers can teach us a lot about, you know, police officers, for example. Um, it's not just about the phenomena. The phenomena is interesting, but it's interesting because it informs a certain kind of theory that we don't yet know enough about. We don't yet know enough about how these people make sense when they're distributed in a million Zoom rooms or something. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. So, so every study has this challenge of taking from a specific context, but it transfers through the sort of theoretical insights and the addition to the theory that it contributes. So that's that's how we talk about the motivation. I think the best way to learn how to do this is read a lot of papers that you admire um, and don't necessarily read them for the content or the theory or the expectation that the phenomena will be the same. Read them for how the reader convinces you of what's going on here and why it's important and become really mindful of almost, almost reverse engineer how that paper does that work to make you care about the phenomena, to make you see it as a phenomena that we don't have enough theory about, and then to convince you of what the extension to that theory um, is. And I think that will, will hopefully speak to kind of the craft of how this is done both qualitatively and in other types of papers. If I may briefly add uh, good references, especially on the qualitative side, Karen, Gold, uh, Karen Locke and uh, Karen golden in the late 90s wrote a, a book on this, but there's also an AMJ publications where they analyze the introductions of, of AMJ papers. Uh, it's a fantastic read for this. I'll place the citations in the, uh, in the chat on the PDW, not this one, not the Zoom chat, the ones for the PDW. Uh, Anna Maria Brumis. 
you have the next question. Uh, okay, yes. So my question refers to something that was brought up in the breakout session about collecting data from non-American contexts. So I've heard that there can be extra scrutiny from reviewers about the quality of such data. And I'm wondering if there are special considerations that authors should think about and present when collecting and, and writing about data from non-American contexts. Anyone wants okay. to take this one? Go, go ahead, Daslo. Is it okay? So, um, well, you know, we certainly welcome um, studies from different contexts, and 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 I think, you know, on the plus side, uh, reviewers and editors and you know readers are excited to read, uh, you know, studies from different contexts. And you know, sometimes it's it is boring to to get, to get the uh, same you know studies always from the from the same setting at the same time we would like to know more about it we, we like to understand what's going on and um, certainly more information you can provide is is the better how the study was done you, you know and um, who are the subjects and and all, all the information as as much as uh, you can disclose recently you know um, we, we received a few papers that, for example, um, were, you know, there were some uh, examples cited on, on non-English, <laughs> you know, languages and, and, and uh, even authors recommended that use Google Translate if you would like to read it. But our journal is published in English and our, our uh, common language uh, and, and so all the reviewers need to understand, need to be able to Really. So, so my point is just, uh, you know, be transparent about what you've done, explain, answer questions to, you know, to the, when the editors and reviewers ask questions about your data. I would, I would add to this quickly and say that I think it's, as, as Lazo mentioned, like it is exciting to have data from other parts of the world. I think most of our data is heavily centered on North America. And all we know about organizational behavior and management comes from one particular region of the world. So tying that back to what to the conversation we know, like you know, going to the previous comments about tying your conversation with new samples to the conversations that exist and how you're advancing knowledge would be extremely valuable, I believe. Uh, to the field of the management broadly and in particular you know we would value such novelty uh, at AMJ as long as there is theoretical contribution so it's not just a new context but there is an actual underlying theoretical contribution uh, to this work. I hope that makes a, a little bit more sense as well but I think that's exciting to hear that people are considering collecting data like that. Thank you. Thank you Anna Maria for your question. Thank you Laszlo Ivona. The next uh, question would be from Yun Park. If you Park, if you might uh, want. Hello. Yeah. Uh, in this session, I heard a lot of uh, know about a lot of uh, theoretical contribution, and I used the quantitative methods. So I was wondering if there is any difference in standard difference between quantitative methods and qualitative method in terms of a theoretical contribution, because qualitative methods is more uh, based on theory building, uh, while quantitative methods focus more on theory testing. So is there any different standards between quantitative or ex expectations between quantitative or qualitative methods in terms of uh, novelty of a theoretical development? Thank you. Anyone wants, wants to take this one? I would lean on the no answer. So on a scale of one to seven, there's hardly any difference, at least in my, my, my experience. 
the uh, the point I made in in the breakout session about this was one of the pattern that I've seen looking at the reviewers' comments when it came to the theoretical contribution. Uh, and, and granted, I handle more qual quantitative paper, but I've I've handled a few qualitative papers as well. Uh, it, they were looking for a meaningful contribution. So it, to me, the, the key word was not new. It was not cool. It was not interesting. It was meaningful. It makes a difference. It brings new meaning to the, the body of academic knowledge about a phenomenon. So regardless of the methods, regardless of the data, regardless of the domain, was this a meaningful contribution, something that adds or change what we knew before reading the paper in the first place. Any other AE you want to comment? Last little Jen. I agree. Well said. Um, I think we have time for, we have one more hand up and I think we, we promised uh, that we would wrap up a few minutes ago, but we're but it's great to get your questions. So let's have that one last question, and then um, I just have a couple of thank yous. So Lydia, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so because of the pandemic, I had to switch to online format uh, for uh, conducting interviews, and I'm wondering whether I should actually wait <laughs> and stop this now, or I should continue and it will be okay. Because I mean, it's not in a traditional way when we actually sit uh, next to the person. It's uh, Zoom or Skype with the informants. So my sense is that it's fine. <laughs> um, I mean, there's actually some benefits over like Zoom over like the telephone. You know, you can you, if you get the person where you can actually see them, you can pick up on the interpersonal cues. You can you know um, even get a little bit of the context perhaps. Um, I think nothing's ever going to be in person, but um, I think the Zoom's pretty close, or you know, um, electronic video is pretty close. And you know, with what we're operating in now, a lot of people are having to move more in this direction. And so, uh, I don't see a paper being rejected because the data was collected electronically versus in person. Thank you. Okay. Let me also add that you know we we are a community, so. The reviewers are facing the same problems, and and they they appreciate they they struggle with the same issues. And in fact, you know, if you if you provide some solutions to their same problems, maybe they are you know get excited, and they you know they I, I think they will appreciate the new approaches because they struggle with the same problems too. Yeah. I think um, that's a great note to end on. We're all in an unusual time. We all need to have compassion for the changes that we all have to adjust to collectively. Um, and I think you will find a receptive audience as long as you explain you know, what you did and why. Um, and that's, this is the reality that we're in. Um, we're one minute before the hour. A huge thank you to um, my co-conspirators and co-Canadians, uh, Denny and Ivona, for pulling us together, um, especially Denny, because um, the tech hasn't been 100% straightforward. And thank you, all of the associate editors who showed up, um, Laszlo, um, Lindy, um, Elizabeth, um, Andrew Knight, and Heather, and Luis. I think it's an hour later. Well, it is an hour later. It's 9 PM for him. He's not with us. Floor, um, who am I missing? Uh, I said Heather already. Um, if I missed you, huge apologies, but um, we've had a great group here. I hope the breakouts were really useful. Um, do your best work, send it to AMJ when it's ready, and um, we look forward to seeing it. Thanks all for showing up, and we'll see you all again in the future. In the future. Thank you, Jan, for helping organize this. Thank you, Laszlo, and all the AEs. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Susan, as well. Hey. And Susan. Yes. <laughs>
really clunky 